Hello, and welcome to another Clark University Major Spotlight. I'm your host, Jared Gibson Faber. Uh, today, I'm pleased to introduce you to the Chair of Environmental Science at Clark, uh, Professor Christopher Williams. Um, Chris, would you take a moment to introduce yourself and let us know a little bit about your, your role at Clark? Yeah, so greetings, everybody. I'm glad you're with us. Um, as Gerard just said, uh, Professor Christopher Williams, I've been at Clark for over a decade now, and I am overseeing the environmental science program. My home department is in geography, um, and I work a lot with partners in biology and international development and community and environment departments to deliver the environmental science major. That's awesome. Thank you. And I, I also, I think your position kind of speaks to how interdisciplinary almost everything at Clark is. Um, you're really not uh, pigeonholed into one specific major or one specific um, experience. So. Um, and you just lit that up with your title. So thank you for that. So uh, I want to talk today a little bit about uh, environmental science at Clark um, and the way I like to do this, start at the beginning. So um, I'd love to hear a little bit about the major, maybe in terms of its popularity, uh, its structure, um, maybe what first year students can expect. Uh, so you can really take that wherever you'd like. Sure, so the, the basic numbers for environmental science are 3, 20, 60. We have three different tracks that are from, uh, delivered from our three core departments. Again, those are biology, geography, and IDCE, or International Development Community Environment. We have about 20 plus faculty, maybe even 20, as many as 24 or 25 at the moment, and we have about 60 undergraduate majors. So those are the basic numbers that constitute the environmental science program. Awesome. You want to go into a little bit about some of the classes that students can expect to take their first year, um, maybe uh, an intro level course or a first year intensive course if environmental science kind of offers those in those three different um, departments? Yeah, happy to. So uh, I'm going to talk about the pathway through the major overall. Sure. All of our students start with our three core courses and those core courses introduce majors and even just prospective majors to the different flavors of environmental science that we offer. We have three different tracks, and those tracks represent environmental and conservation biology, um, earth system science, and environmental science and policy. So the first introduction to the major is to explore what those three different tracks are like, and each of our three major contributing departments offer those with specialty. Each one of our different tracks of the major involve then introductory level science classes, which is a mix of elective and required courses. Um, all the majors require quantitative skills, typically statistics and or calculus, uh, sometimes some field methods and bench work type experience. The majors typically then move into the advanced science coursework, uh, most of which is elective. There are a variety of opportunities students can choose to, based on their interests. And then we get into some parallel adjacent science courses, for example, maybe more coursework in physics and or chemistry. We have science, so social science coursework across all of the different tracks, and ultimately we conclude the experience with a capstone, which kind of rounds it out and gives the students a chance to put their skills and knowledge into practice. So in addition to the three core courses, our majors typically, or even prospective majors, first-year students, typically start with a first-year intensive. And there are a whole range of FYIs across the university, and not all of our majors will necessarily take their FYI in environmental science, but many do. And just to give you a few examples of recent FYIs in the environmental science program, we have had one on the changes in the Arctic. It's called Arctic System Science, or Arctic in the Anthropocene. Uh, that was one. Another one was in forest ecology. And then the intro bio class, intro biology, biology 101, can also be taken as an FYI. Awesome. That is great information. I think probably the clearest cut, uh, like overall path through a major I've had on one of these yet. So thank you very much for that. I, I think that leaves nothing to wonder or question. Um, but I'd love to ask a, a little further into it. Um, so as the chair of the department, can you talk a little bit about um, how sort of you as a professor and, and some of your colleagues go through advising first year and, and newer students within environmental science? Um, since it is such an interdisciplinary major, is it, do you have to port students into it? Do you have to help, help students figure out if this makes sense for them? Like, how, how does that work? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the best parts of the job is getting to know our students and our majors in a kind of one-on-one -on -one way. Um, you know, so we have a program guide, first of all, which we recently developed, which provides a lot of information. But most of the important information is really, it, it's, it evolves through conversations, conversations with 
faculty conversations with me, uh, the program director, sometimes those take place in kind of a group format where our prospective and budding environmental scientists are learning from upper class students who have already uh, you know, been through the ropes and, and maybe made some mistakes and have some advice and tips. So I organize uh, group advising sessions, which help students get to know who else is interested in the major, what they studied, and which courses they would maybe recommend. Sometimes the students themselves, and peer students, are the best sort of um, advocates for and, and um, ambassadors for the, the, the best parts of our program. Um, but also we have, of course, faculty advising, which is well beyond just what courses will you take next semester, but also trying to cultivate an awareness and understanding and a set of interests in what ultimate career a student may pursue in, in the field. And also we encourage our students in those sessions to consider research opportunities and internships and to uh, make sure that they're paying attention to the calendar of events all across campus with speaker series and you know, opportunities to volunteer or get engaged. Uh, so there are a lot of different ways in which we advise our students. Um, one question we often get is how exact, so I'm interested in environmental science, how do I find a major advisor? You know, I arrived to Clark not knowing that environmental science would be the, the field I want to pursue. Now that I'm interested in majoring, how do I declare and who would be my advisor? Turns out there are several ways to be assigned an advisor or to secure an advisor. One is if the student has a personal connection with the professor with whom they've had a class, we can allow the student to opt in and ask that professor um, if they would be willing to serve as their major advisor. And hopefully they'll have capacity and usually um, faculty are, are more than enthusiastic to take on that role. Another pathway is I as director can, um, you know, encourage a student to uh, pursue one of maybe three or four different advisors in a particular track, or I can ask the nudge the professors to consider reaching out to a prospective major in the field. So there are several different pathways and, and we make sure that there's a good uh, handoff and connection. It's also worth noting that uh, sometimes our advisees like to switch and they might want to get to know another professor and sometimes that helps with uh, you know, the letter writing down the, down the road as we write, you know, letters of recommendation. So there are lots of ways to get to know professors in environmental science. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I think Clark being kind of a smaller institution, we have that, I don't know, it plays to our advantage that our students come in and have a variety of interests and maybe want to switch here and there and our faculty know like, oh yes, you know, my colleague over in biology, you'd have a great time with them or my, you know, colleague in chemistry or something like that. So. Exactly. Um, I, I tell students that it happens, but it's, it's nice to hear that it happens from a, a faculty member, <laughs> for sure. Um, so awesome. So you talked, when you were talking about kind of the path through the major, you, were talk, you talked a little bit about um, steps after the introductory phase, like different research right. opportunities and, and skill building opportunities. I'd like to focus on that a little bit, if that's all right. Um, so can you just talk a little bit about maybe recent research students have done, um, you know, of their own volition at Clark in environmental science and some of the maybe skills and competencies, there it is. Um, that they've picked up as a result? Absolutely. So research shows up in a lot of ways through our curriculum, uh, in our coursework, and in student-directed independent research opportunities. So, um, you know, as faculty, we, we uh, you know, are, are, we have a world-class set of expertise. Uh, we, we work on all seven continents. We examine biodiversity, conservation, toxicity in the environment, um, uh, changes in ecosystems in response to global change. We study climate change and food security, food systems, and much more beyond all of that. Um, and all of that shows up in the coursework that our students take. Uh, it shows up because we as professors, of course, love to provide examples from our own research and that of our peers and our students. Um, it also shows up in ways that students bring to the class through their research, both undergraduate students and sometimes graduate students as well, which is another a unique part of what can be the Clark classroom experience, particularly at the advanced undergraduate level. Mm -hmm. um, so it shows up in our coursework and there are a lot of opportunities to deepen that, those points of connection. For example, um, do we just completed three um, e environmental science undergraduate honors theses. One of them was performed by a student who worked with me and she was studying um, how we can measure the impact of forest cover loss and deforestation across parts of the United States with meteorological weather stations that measure temperature. Uh, so we've been studying um, how loss of forest causes local surface warming um, using remote sensing data and meteorological stations. So it's just one example. Another student was studying snow cover and sea ice loss in the high Arctic. And another student was studying the um, 
biological and physical impacts of, of very severe wildfire in the tundra landscapes of the high uh, northern regions uh, in, in Alaska. And so those are just a few examples of the, the hands-on, very intensive research that some of our students uh, engage in. And in each one of those cases, actually, while it connects to one of our faculty's ex interests and expertise, the selection of topic was strongly influenced also in collaboration with the student to follow their interests. That's awesome. That's it's through throughout these spotlights, this the the message of collaboration and, and teamwork, student to student, faculty to student, faculty to faculty has just been so uh, awesome for me to just hear. So uh, love to hear it again for sure. Um, I have a question that's kind of off the cuff, if you will. Um, so we're located in Worcester, Massachusetts, so yeah. kind of a larger urban uh, space. Um, do students ever find it difficult to like be in the environments that they want to study? Like, do we do well at, at putting students out there in different spaces, utilizing Worcester and their surrounding area? Um, yeah. We do. We do a great job with that in, in several ways. You know, a lot of people are interested in the environment, myself included, because we like being out in the natural, in the wild environment. Yeah. Um, and so the, our classes regularly take students, you know, with vans and buses out into the, the sort of central Massachusetts and even the, the local urban, um, but near urban green spaces within the Worcester area. Um, we have some wonderful Audubon parks and Massachusetts DCR or Department of Conservation and Recreation spaces here in Worcester and in our you know partner cities and the, the rural landscapes surrounding Worcester and you know there we ha all have all of us professors have kind of our familiar haunts that we like to visit. Um, we are lucky at Clark to have uh, the Hadwin Arboretum, which is a special landscape that we own. It's very close to campus and students have been working really hard in an urban greening class to spruce it up and make it um, much more pleasant to document the trees, to make uh, forest measurements of kind of the standing stock of biomass and carbon stocks and identify all the trees to species, any coarse woody debris, so that we really use the, the local environment, both within Worcester, uh, but also out to the, the more wild parts of the state um, to you know, study all things environment. That's Some awesome. students have also studied kind of toxicity in the urban space. And we, in my hydrology class, we study the modifications that have been made to the, the sort of local hydrologic networks and stream networks by just walking around, uh, you know, the, the sur urban landscape surrounding Clark and, and driving out into the more rural areas where we see, you know, complete transformation of what were, would have been wild streams into, you know, now streams that are buried under concrete and then reemerge, but often with high toxicity. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we are exploring all dimensions in, in, in the wild and from Worcester to, to Boston and, and all the way out into the, the rural parts of the state. That's awesome. Yeah. And I ask you that because just students want to develop and build skills and they want to be in places where they can develop and build skills. So I just, I like to nail home the fact that, you know, we use our environment well and when we can't use the environment to, you know, reach a goal. We'll find a way to get you to a different environment, such that you can right. you know, pursue what you're looking for. Awesome. So I want to transition a little bit into kind of the later stages of the environmental studies, um, you know, journey. Um, so could we talk a little bit about the capstone process for for majors in environmental science? Like, is it a specific class? Do students can they come forward with projects that they have thought of themselves? Like, how how do capstones kind of happen? In environmental science? It's a wide mix, um, which is, you know, again, kind of a Clark, a Clark <laughs> attribute, you know, it, it's, there's an element of student choice, but then there are sort of uh, fallback mechanisms for students who may not have decided what their capstone experience should be, and we help them sort that out. Sometimes it's a class that is a research-oriented class, or it's a hands-on oriented class, or maybe even a problems of practice course mm -hmm. that sort of gets students beyond just the basic theory that we introduce in some of our basic coursework. Um, and into the applied practice of the field that can be, um, you know, actual hands-on internships with uh, partners like with the Mass Audubon Society or Massachusetts DCR, as I mentioned, Department of mm -hmm. Conservation and Recreation, or the Nature Conservancy, or other institutions that we as faculty and sometimes through our students have direct connections with. Um, it could also be our, through, sometimes a capstone is part of a study abroad experience where a student performed a directed research, maybe through the School for Field Studies, one of our most popular programs for environmental science scientists. 
and sometimes it's summer research, whether at Clark or through an internship with our alumni network. So there are lots of different ways to satisfy the capstone experience because we recognize that really what makes a capstone is not simply always in the classroom, but really it can be a, a whole variety of experiences. And so it's, it's an interactive decision, again, between the faculty and the student. That's awesome. And is it ever difficult for faculty members who are advising capstone pursuers to like have them narrow down just the wide variety that they have uh, available to them? Or is, do you find it's pretty like a fluid kind of natural? It can be really overwhelming because there's so <laughs> many great opportunities. Sometimes we, you know, I often worry that there aren't enough. And, and then I hear from students that they're overwhelmed with the choices. And so <laughs> that is part of the advising process. Absolutely. And you know, one of the things that students might learn is that they, they tried something out and they discovered that's not really what their interest was. And, and I remind them that that too is a very valuable experience. Um, so, you know, we, we try things out and, you know, we, we try to ignite a passion or follow a passion in the student. But, uh, you know, it, may not, it doesn't always work. Uh, but I think, you know, we're, we're successful in one way or another. That's awesome. And then I, I think the final thing I want to know about kind of environmental science majors at Clark is where they're all ending up. Do you find students um, go straight into employment? Do you find students who are pursuing you know, graduate degrees, um, either at Clark with the fifth year tuition free master program or elsewhere? Um, where, where, where are environmental majors going? All of that and, and more. Um, our students make it into private consulting firms who work on environmental issues. They work in NGOs, non-governmental organizations, maybe doing policy or advocacy work. They work in science uh, labs, in research, in tech, in industry. Uh, they end up in um, academia and you know, doing what I do in some cases um, long down the road. Um, sometimes they work with federal government institutions like the USGS, uh, making measurements of hydrologic flows. I'm thinking of one student in particular. Um, and so there are all sorts of different kinds of outcomes from government to non-government, from policy to academics and research and from industry and business to kind of the um, you know, politics and, and decision-making. Awesome. Well, I think you've given us a great snapshot of the environmental science program at Clark. Uh, you know, everything from FYIs and, and advising in the first year to uh, finishing up and, and finding a career path. So um, I do like to end on a more mushy note though, if that's okay with you. Uh, would you mind? There are gonna be a lot of, uh, you know, admitted students, prospective students watching this. So um, if you okay. could give one piece of advice to future Clarkies, future environmental science majors, um, what would that advice be? Um, <laughs> all right, uh, um, my advice is don't overthink it. Um, if you get into Clark, count yourself lucky and just come. Uh, we <laughs> offer an outstanding education. It's a super welcoming and supportive group of faculty, students, and staff. Uh, we're deeply committed to helping students discover their passion and interests, to deepen their knowledge and skills, and to develop expertise and then to put it into practice with authentic experience. So I hope you'll join us, uh, come to Clark. Awesome, Professor Williams, I could not have said that better myself. My, so, this has been my pleasure, thanks so much. <laughs> thanks for spending time with me today.